So my name is Maureen Smith, and I'm pleased to co-host today's webinar with Jen Thornhill Verma. We have an impressive roster of speakers joining us today. Um, here, they are listed in their order of appearance with their organizational affiliations. Thank you to Joanna, Kathleen, Paula, Paula David, and Zayan for being here today to share your insights. We also have our colleagues, Francois Pierre Gauvin, online and Steve Lott, who's the producer of today's webinar. So following our opening remarks, each presenter will speak for five minutes. We are reserving time for your questions. Please use the chat box to pose your questions at any time throughout today's webinar. Our colleagues from the Global Evidence Commission are on hand to answer your questions and share resources in the chat. So this webinar series is co-hosted by Cochrane, the Global Evidence Commission, and the World Health Organization's Evidence-Informed Policy Network, also known as EVIPNET. So here's a recap of sessions in this series. And we have two more upcoming in 2024, one specifically on co-design and another, I'll just call it a bonus session for now, that we're cooking up to, for, for, uh, to round out the series. So stay tuned for details on that one. Those, those, through these webinars, we often refer to the Global Evidence Commission's landmark report and its first update last January. We have another update report forthcoming in January 2024. Our work and our partners prioritizes putting evidence at the center of everyday life. This is a key implementation goal alongside the other two, strengthening evidence support systems domestically and globally. We've structured the webinar series to address the ways we can work to put evidence at the center of everyday life. Today, we will focus mostly on the first of these, helping citizens judge what others are claiming or more generally, find and receive reliable information on a topic. The webinar series also aligns with the work of the Global Evidence Commission's Citizen Leadership Group, which I co-chair. Our work aims to identify promising practices and innovations, document supporting evidence and opportunities for improvement, and identify ways to implement and scale up this work. Finally, to raise awareness. So I'll turn it over now to Jen to introduce today's webinar theme. Over to you, Jen. Thanks so much, Maureen. Thanks for that introduction. We are pleased that you could join us today. We know the stakes for misinformation, disinformation are high and our current state of infodemic or what sometimes people call the misinfodemic, the rapid spread of misinformation really can have serious consequences. So in this third session in our series, we're exploring different strategies such as fact checking along with different vehicles to address misinformation through journalism and news outlets, through social media, for example. And as Maureen mentioned, the Global Evidence Commission landmark report, it does offer content on this topic and we're gonna be upping these battle the bunk bits, I'll call them, through our social channels. We'll encourage you to do the same. We felt that there was no one better position than our first speaker to give us a backgrounder on what misinformation is. So I'm gonna turn it over to Joanna Pope, but just to say that Joanna is a PhD scholar with Evidence Synthesis Ireland. She's the HRB Trials Methodology Research Network as well with them, based at the University of Galway. And her current work focuses on defining facts and misinformation in health contexts. So Joanna, over to you. Thank you, Jen. Um, hi, everyone. Um, as Jen said, I'm Joanna Pope. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Galway in Ireland, and my PhD is part of the iHealth FAFS fact checking project in Ireland, which Paula, my supervisor, will introduce later. Um, I got into this project because I think it's important for people to have good information when they need to make decisions. Um, and that part of that is helping them spot and reject misinformation when they see it. Um, but as I've gone through my PhD, I've seen that the word misinformation can stir up some strong feelings. Um, not everyone agrees about what actually qualifies as misinformation. So for the past year and a half now, um, I've been reading from and talking with people in different roles to figure out how they define health misinformation, where they see eye to eye, and where they disagree. Um, so to kick things off today, I'm just going to 
take a moment with you to review what we mean when we talk about misinformation and maybe a little bit about why it's not always so straightforward. Um, I'll be drawing on some preliminary findings from my own research, but also on findings from the McMaster Health Forum's 2022 Citizen Panel on putting evidence at the center of everyday life. Um, and you can find out more about both of these projects in the reference section of these slides, which I think will be made available after this session. Yeah, I'm getting a nod. So yes, after this session. Um, so the term misinformation has been around for quite some time, but it really made its mark in public health and in healthcare during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic, when the World Health Organization declared an infodemic. Um, so in simple terms, an infodemic is a situation where people are flooded with too much information during a disease outbreak like COVID, including both good information and misinformation, and they have to make decisions about which of this information to trust. Next slide. The word misinformation was coined to cover all sorts of information that might not be trustworthy. Um, I've listed out the main types of information that typically get bundled under this misinformation label in research and in academic settings. Um, and I think it can be useful to think about these types as falling on a sort of spectrum. So on one end, you have stuff that is clearly and just absolutely false, like scams and flat out lies. Uh, but on the other end, it gets a bit murkier because we're dealing with people's personal opinions about health treatments or their misunderstandings about health topics. So here we're less in the realm of outright lies and more in the territory of people's opinions or their values-based considerations about what's best for health. Um, next slide. So if you ask an expert how to spot misinformation, they might tell you to look for red flags. Um, so they might tell you to think about whether the information comes from a non-credible source, if it disagrees with expert consensus, if it uses emotional language, and especially if it doesn't line up with scientific evidence. Next slide. But in the real world, people often disagree about how much weight to give scientific evidence when they're trying to make health decisions. So their views of evidence can be shaped by their experiences or by historical factors or social factors. Um, for example, they may be naturally less inclined to trust research if they belong to a group that's been exploited or marginalized in research, or if the evidence is presented in a way that's stigmatizing. Next slide. And when we've spoken to people about how they evaluate information in real life, we've found that it also depends on how they are planning to use the information. So for example, when healthcare providers are looking for information to guide clinical decisions or answer their patients' questions, they put a lot of stock in solid scientific evidence. They want to know what the best studies say for the best outcomes. Um, but when people are making personal decisions, they don't rely on scientific evidence as heavily. In that sort of situation, they're not just looking to optimize a specific outcome based on scientific evidence, they're looking to feel better overall. So they might consider scientific evidence, but they're usually also weighing other things like advice from people they trust who have experience and whether the recommendations made by scientists are in line with their moral values and what practical trade-offs they might have to make if they follow the evidence. Um, and of course, they're making these calls with just a little slice of the information that's out there because they can't access all the evidence in the world every time they need to make a decision. And I think one of the consequences of this is that when people are evaluating information in the context of their own lives, they you don't usually think about evidence as the be all end all for what deciding what is misinformation. Um, instead, they tend to define it much more broadly um, as any information that isn't usable to them. So that might be because it's not appropriate for their social context or because it's not practical to implement in their settings or because their health organizations don't support it or because following it would have other consequences for their lives. Um, so misinformation for a lot of people is just any information that doesn't help them to make a good decision that they're happy with. Um, so following on, oh, sorry, next slide. Okay, so following on from this feedback, the Global Commission on Evidence to Address Societal Challenges published some recommendations for people who have a role in sharing information and in combating misinformation. Um, these are mainly around making evidence more accessible to people when they're making decisions, but they're also around sort of broadening our ideas about what kinds of evidence are important for making decisions, um, as well as making sure that our evidence 
generating processes, consider people's values and priorities and needs so that these things are considered from the very beginning of the scientific process. Um, and I know our speakers have a lot of ideas about how we might do this. So I think I will wrap up here and pass over to them. Um, but before I do, I'd just like to say thanks again for having me. I'm really just thrilled to be here and to learn from the other speakers. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. And thank you for showing your homework and sharing all your references. Here they are. And just to reiterate what you shared earlier, the slides will be made available. This webinar is being recorded. Um, I saw a, a hand raised just now. Please put your questions in chat. We've reserved ample time to get to those. And of course, we're encouraging speakers too that if there is a question in the chat that you wanna go in and answer, feel free, but we will raise that to your attention shortly. I'm gonna pass things over to Kathleen, who's the Youth Programming Manager with MediaWise, a teen fact-checking network. And before Kathleen was involved in this very important work, she taught high school journalism for 18 years. And before that was a local reporter with the Tampa Bay Times. So, so pleased to hear your perspective and over to you, Kathleen. Okay, thank you so much for that introduction. I appreciate it. And thank you for inviting us here uh, to just tell you a little bit about our program. Um, so I am part of MediaWise, which is also part of the Pointer Institute, which is based in St. Petersburg, Florida. But our what we have is called the Teen Fact-Checking Network, and it is a virtual newsroom of teens. We're across the United States and actually have now started expanding to um, a couple of other countries also. Um, but I mainly work with the U.S. students. We have anywhere from like 12 to 20 students each semester, um, and we're, called, we're a digital fact-checking newsroom. The kids are 13 to 18 years old, excuse me, <clears throat> 13 to 18 years old, um, mainly high school. Sometimes we've had eighth graders. Um, they apply. They have to show us um, their writing. They have to do a video for us. We accept them. We train them in fact checking. Um, and basically the way it works is we want them to find the uh, what they think might be misinformation on the platforms that they're on. So they're on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube. Um, and they make a pitch to us and we decide, is that something you want to make a video on? They get a thumbs up or whatever. Um, <clears throat> they write a, <clears throat> sorry, they write a script. Um, we go back and forth, writing, helping them write that and they get the thumbs up to, to uh, write. Um, <clears throat> the idea is that if they find the misinformation on a particular platform, then we publish the video on that platform also. Um, so their videos are published on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram, and Twitter, actually Twitter also. Um, you can go to the next slide. I wanted to show you uh, one of their videos. It's only a minute long. Um, this is Catherine Yang. She is from Florida, also South Florida. Um, this is a good example of a type of video that they do when there is breaking news. They may find a specific bit of misinformation, or in this case, what they do is they um, there's a breaking news story, and we want to make sure that people understand that everything that's going out online right now might not be true. So be careful. So this is Catherine, and she's going to give you a little lesson on that. The Maui fires have been all over the news, causing a slew of conspiracy theorists to come up with their own reasons for how the fires started, like these, which have been seen by thousands of viewers. Many people are presenting these theories as facts, and that's a problem. Before jumping to conclusions about tragic events like this, make sure to do a little research first. I did a keyword search using the words Maui fires and cause of it and found many articles and opinions on the topic. To make sure I got the best information, I practiced a tip called click restraint. I didn't just click on the first result. I scrolled down to find the most reliable sources. Each of the articles focus on many different theories. But sure enough, no cause has been officially determined, though some evidence points to power lines as a possible cause. These bogus posts that claim to know the cause of the fire are a great example of letting our emotions and opinions get the best of us before we really know the facts. When tragedy hits and news is still breaking, pause and double check the facts instead of simply hitting share. Okay. So uh, that's a good example. Um, you can go to the next slide too. Um, uh, that's a good example of what we do. Um, we. I think it's important to say that 
we're not just fact checkers. The kids don't just fact check. They show you how they did the fact check. And before they even do this, we do a little bit of training with them, several, several days of training with them on different techniques that they can use. Um, and for example, she talked about um, doing a keyword search. She talked about click restraint, not clicking on the first thing. She talked about how when you're online, sometimes your emotions get the best of you. And that's sort of a technique that people use so that you will click or maybe believe. Um, so she not only tells you what might be true or not true, she also shows you how she did it and the and, and the research that she did to go along with it. The thing that I think that makes us a little bit different is that it's not me making those videos because kids don't want to see me making those videos. You know, they want to see their peers um, and it's more likely that they might listen to what they're saying. So we have the teams uh, create the videos um, and we reach them where they are on the social media and that their platforms where they're focused on. And we try to choose topics that they're interested in. I mean, the one that you see there about Keanu Reeves, that was a deep fake that probably got the most clicks last year of all the videos that we made. Um, <clears throat> and how you can go to the next one. Um, so last year in a partnership we had with PBS Student Reporting Labs, we produced, um, we, have a, we have several different kinds of videos that we make. We do short form one minute TikToks like Catherine just did. But we also do longer five or six minute um, YouTube videos, which are part of our Is This Legit series. Um, and last year we made one Is This Legit series uh, videos a, a week. We did 30 of them. This year we kind of narrowed them down and now they have a lesson plan to go with them. Um, we have 15 lessons now and I can drop the link into the chat after this. Um, and we've kind of um, separated them out into maybe four units. We have fact checking fundamentals, we have um, four lessons on evaluating sources. We have three lessons on recognizing fake news, three lessons on artificial intelligence, because we think these are the topics that the teachers want to be talking with their kids about. And then we have a final project where they actually get to make their own video. So that's our curriculum. And I'll drop that link in. Um, that's sort of my overview of it all. I think I've probably taken up enough time and I'll move on. <laughs> if anyone has any Perfect. questions, let me know. Perfect timing, and I knew a journalist would achieve that. Um, I'm going to stop sharing here as Paula brings up her slides, and just to say that you know one of the reasons we wanted to show that particular example is because it meets teens where they are on topics that they care about. One of the things we do want to drill into in the Q and A is you know what role does research evidence play or can it play in addressing misinformation? So what can we learn from an example like media wise that help makes the general public evidence wise? Um, to our speakers, a quick cue that a couple of you have received questions. We're encouraging you, if you can, to answer those in chat. So a question for Kathleen around the criteria you use to train youth members in fact-checking. You did speak to that uh, after that question was posed. And then Joanna, a uh, question around whether you consider, uh, what do you consider good science or quality research? And then what we'll do is when we come back to Q&A, we can do a quick recap of the types of things we're hearing in the chat and continue to uh, ask more questions. So Paula, I see your slides. Uh, and just to say, Paula, thanks for joining us, senior postdoctoral researcher with Evidence Synthesis International uh, and HRB Trials Methodology Research Network at the University of Galway, lead researcher on iHealth Facts, which we're gonna hear about today. And your work focuses on evidence synthesis, I can say that word, scientific uncertainty, and how health facts and misinformation are defined, dealt with, and communicated. So thank goodness you're here. Over to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Jen. And thank you again for the invite for myself and Joanna. We're delighted to be here. I uh, just want to acknowledge our funders, the Health Research Board and the Health Service Executive, and our PI Professor, Declan Devan. So iHealth Facts is a project that was set up during the COVID-19 pandemic um, when it became obvious that there was a dearth of information that was available and accessible for members of the public. Um, so even though evidence syntheses were being done right through the pandemic for policymakers, people need to know, you know what, what, what the facts around a situation are. So iHealth Facts is a website where members of the public can submit questions about health interventions. So this might be something to do with, they've heard on social media that 
X diet is good for you or bad for you or such and such a supplement or such and such a treatment, etc. So our website is easily accessible. It's very easy to submit a question. And then we, as researchers in the University of Galway, uh, take over and we have a process uh, for answering those questions and then writing them, hopefully, in a very easily understandable way. So I'll give you a few examples of questions we've been asked and answered. Uh, does cold seawater swimming improve health? Does consuming protein after workout build muscle? Does wearing a face mask prevent COVID-19 infection? Exposure to Wi-Fi associated with a brain cancer, antiperspirant and breast cancer, arnica for bruising and inflammation. Our process, here's a picture of some of our, some of our lovely reviewers. Uh, our process is as follows. So question is submitted by a member of the public. Our first and second reviewers, which are part of our core, core team in the university, undertake a review of the evidence on that topic. It then goes to external review uh, to topic experts or methodological experts. Very important part of the process is our public and patient reps who review every claim that goes through. And finally, it goes to a health journalist um, who also helps make sure that we're writing everything in an understandable way. And then finally, it is published on the website. Our questions are answered in three parts. There's a short answer, a longer summary with links to studies, and then finally a little bit on the key concepts for critical thinking that are relevant to this uh, question. And we take those key concepts from the Informed Health Choices website where there are 49 very easy to understand concepts for critical thinking about health claims. It's a really, really brilliant website if anyone is not familiar. I'm going to show you just the three parts now of one answer, one question we were asked, which when we were asked, I thought there's no way there's any information on this out there. Does eating prunes improve bone density? So this is the first part, a sample first part of our uh, answer, where we give a very short explanation of the question and what we found or didn't find. Uh, the second part of our answer then, as you can see in this situation, we we didn't, we normally look for sub, um, systematic reviews, first of all. In this situation, we didn't find systematic reviews. We found four individual studies and we try and describe those in lay language as best we can and summarize also the quality of the evidence and you know how certain we can be about the findings. Here are some of the key concepts we added into this particular question. So sometimes people don't think about the side effects of treatment because they want to see improvements. Even if the treatment is natural, it doesn't mean it's not 100% safe and without side effects. And I think that had to do in, in this case of eating too many prunes and you can imagine <laughs> how that might affect you. Um, that's all I have uh, for you now. Um, and if there's any questions, I'd be delighted to answer um, in, in the chat or in the in, in the uh, Q&A at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paula, for that great presentation. I, I think what, it, what, what stands out for me is that there's so many websites on debunking misinformation and you know, they're all over the internet, but yours comes, the questions are submitted by the public. And I know I can't ask the question now, but I wonder whether those questions that come from the public would be really different than if you sat down with a group of research researchers and said, what do you think the public wants to hear? But you're not doing that. You're actually taking it from the grassroots. So um, that's great. Thank you so much for that presentation. Sorry guys, you know that there had to be one instance where somebody fumbled for the unmute. So there, I did it. Hopefully that cures us for the rest of the rest of the webinar. Um, the other fumble that sometimes happens is that a speaker is unable to make it due to connectivity issues. And I can say that David Adjacobi tried multiple ways to be here today. He's the Nigeria editor for Africa Check. And they, as part of a uh, Africa-wide fact-checking network, and they're actually part of a global fact-checking network do the job of sorting fact from fiction. That what David was going to speak to us today was how they did that heroic work 
during the recent Nigerian elections, also using AI assisted supports. Uh, what they do is they interrogate public statements. So similarly, as you've heard Paula talk about starting, and of course, uh, Kathleen talk about starting with issues that people really care about, interrogating those with the best available evidence and publishing fact checking uh, uh, reports. So we very much encourage you to check out their work and we will hope to check in with David at a future time. So that brings us to our next uh, and final speaker on today's panel before we move into Q&A. And I see we've got a very active chat. Thank you so much. Keep the questions rolling. Sayan Banerjee is an assistant professor of political science at Texas Tech University. He was a postdoctoral research fellow at the Reuters Institute at the University of Oxford and at the Deliberative Media Lab, part of the Democracy Initiative at the University of Virginia. He has a PhD in government from the University of Essex and his research consists of three interlinked uh, pathways, which I'm sure he'll give us some highlights on. And together he's exploring themes and scholarship on political behavior, identities, political communication, and particularly politics of, of South Asia. Thank you, San, for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here uh, and see you all. Um, I'm going to shift the gears a bit from, uh, from the conversation deliberations we have been having today and just focus on one word, and that's trust. Uh, but first, I'm going to speak a little bit about the challenges towards uh, fact-checking and digital literacy campaigns uh, that have been going, uh, that have been done by uh, our compatriots uh, all over the globe. And it's about the technological affordances, really, uh, the, and the empirical evidence towards fact-checking uh, is that, sure, yes, it's absolutely effective, but it's effective in mostly homogeneous uh, communities and states. So fact-checking has less of persuading power uh, towards making people uh, belief in misinformation change in polarized communities. And you can look just look at the scholarship uh, on the US, for example, where uh, we find that you know, fact-checking has uh, little effect and very short-term effects. Uh, in fact, uh, in some cases, uh, fact-checking can also be counterproductive. It doesn't really do anything to persuade people who believe in misinformation. In fact, it might uh, entrench their belief in whatever the priors they have on any kind of specific issue. So what do I mean by polarization? Well, uh, polarization, I mean the societies, uh, communities which have little intergroup trust. And this kind of polarization may take, you know, sort of very different forms and depending on the sort of dominant uh, sociopolitical cleavages uh, in the place. So for example, uh, in the US, you know, that's mostly uh, partisan ID. So if you're a Democrat or a Republican, uh, it could also be race, it's a both. Uh, in, uh, across the globe, it could be something else. It could be ethnic groups. Uh, for example, a lot of my work is in India and the dominant uh, political cleavage, the social cleavage there is caste, uh, it's ethnicity. Uh, so it's not a uh, political partisan ID. So it really depends on the sort of dominant social political cleavages uh, in the society. On the other hand, uh, you have uh, digital literacy campaigns and how effective are they? Well, uh, we, from a academic perspective, we don't know yet. Uh, a lot of the work um, on digital literacy campaigns is now going on um, in the global south. Uh, there are ongoing projects and I'm sure uh, which my colleagues are um, conducting, and I'm sure we'll have the results in the coming months. Uh, but what we do know is that these digital literacy campaigns also have pretty short-term effects. And the challenge is to turn these short-term effects into sort of long-term effects. Next slide. So what can we do about countering this information? So on the supply side, and what I mean with supply side is from the side of news organizations. 
Well, uh, what we do find, and this is from my previous work with my colleagues at the Reuters Institute, is that there is a big trust gap between the audience and news organizations. And this trust gap has been growing uh, between news outlets and uh, the audience. But so the news organizations have a really big task in building trust with their audiences, but they do have some strategies at their disposal, which can be effective. And what we found is that when news, news organizations, when they do uh, engage with their audiences in using the strategies and these editorial strategies or strategies focused on increasing news transparency, uh, managerial and engage, engagement initiatives, then these strategies can be effective because these strategies reach, can reach out to the audience who are engaged with the news and the audience who trust the news. So that's a bright spot. So what can be some of these strategies? Well, uh, this could be editorial strategies such as solutions-focused journalism, um, also the news focusing on regular people, everyday people. Uh, we found that uh, the audience put a high, very high premium on less sensationalism uh, or having less bias uh, in news. Uh, they also appreciate transparency efforts like news organizations um, correcting their own mistakes and owning up to their mistakes uh, and being very transparent about uh, their journalists and their backgrounds and also their organizational ownership, like you know, who owns this news organization and who are the shareholders, so on and so forth. Uh, the audience has also uh, put a lot of premium on newsroom diversity and different forms of diversity and not just gender, but also ethnic um, and a lot of demographic forms of diversity. And they also appreciate engagement initiatives, both online and offline. Uh, so, so the news organizations really need to, need to reach out to their audiences uh, through online measures such as you know soliciting comments, but also reaching out to their audiences uh, through offline ways. Next slide. But this supply side efforts are not just enough, but there's also the demand side uh, angle. And by what the demand side angle, I mean, you have to put the social in social media. And this is where the trust again comes in, because if we want to transform these short-term effects uh, that the technological affordances such as fact-checking and digital literacy campaigns provide uh, into long-term effects, then the real change needs to happen in the society. We have to reduce intergroup polarization. And to reduce intergroup polarization, you have to build intergroup trust. In other words, intergroup social capital. And this is a kind of very slow and gradual process, right? And this doesn't happen in a single day. Uh, this kind of societal change also needs uh, changes in the policy space. And obviously that's a very gradual and uh, very deliberative effort that can only happen in uh, particularly in democracies. And this is important because what we found empirically uh, from our research, especially with the Reuters Institute, is that offline social networks uh, and, can, and contact can mitigate belief in online misinformation. Uh, and that's what I would say is uh, very, it's a bright spot in uh, what might be a very cloudy uh, uh, picture in the space of misinformation. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Sam. Very helpful. Um, we've now moved into our Q&A space, so I'm actually going to stop sharing slides so that you can see us and we can engage in a, a conversation. Um, you have been posing questions. We've been doing our best to answer them, and we're going to recap some of them. So if you do have continued questions or thoughts, because many of you are working in this space. So thank you for, for sharing your uh, insights and expertise in that area as well. So continue to do that. Uh, I'm gonna give the first question
question uh, to my co-host Maureen. And then our colleague Francois-Pierre Gauvin is uh, gonna do us a major solid and do a quick recap of some of what we're hearing in the chat. Uh, and we'll continue to ask the many questions that, that came in. So Maureen, first over to you for that first question. Thanks, Jen. I think it's called the perks of the job. <laughs> so <clears throat> great, absolutely great presentations and keep those questions coming. They're looking really good. We've got, as you can see, we've allotted plenty of time to answer your questions. So one of the things that I had the privilege of doing uh, this year was sit in on about two half day dialogues with everyday citizens from the province of Ontario where I live on the use of evidence in everyday life. And one of the things that we heard that was discouraging for me to hear was that the other side is winning on misinformation and and that no matter how much we debunk they're just going to they're, they're 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 ahead of the game so given that and what 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 you've all said today um what do you see as roles that everyday citizens can play alongside with those other evidence intermediaries like journalists and researchers to address misinformation beyond the, the roles that you've already outlined. Um, what else do you do you think could happen there to um, bring us into that misinformation world and have us be part of the solution? And, and I'll, I'll ask for a volunteer who'd like to start answering it. Paula, over to you. <laughs> yeah, I think um, part of the part of our eye health facts project that actually excites me the most is the informed health choices and advancing critical thinking. Um, so I think uh, the first step is for all of us uh, to be aware of what healthy skepticism is and how to actually go about it. So having those, I know informed health choices is 49 key concepts, that's a lot, but even to have very basic ideas. So, so for example, um, and particularly during the COVID pandemic and we had various experts out on, on, on media and, so, and social media going, a study has found, you know, well, what do all the other studies on that topic say. So that's one key concept to my mind is, is top of the list. So what is the, the, the global uh, evidence on that topic? It's not just a study has found. So, so the first step for me is, is that we all know how to critique uh, information like that. So it's all about, that's for me is the biggest issue. Thanks Maureen, Paula. can I can I just step in to say, you know, we've been thinking about how to relay and, and liberate some of what we've shared in the Evidence Commission for broader, broader audiences. And what Paula just identified is a great one, because when you become familiar with different forms of evidence, you know that certain forms of evidence can help you address certain questions. You know, what's the magnitude of a problem? Modeling can be really helpful for that. What are people willing to do about it? Behavioral insights. And you know, understanding what evidence synthesis is, even if one doesn't exist for the topic that you're interested in, someone can query that particular issue using that skill set. So Paula just you know nailed that by saying, you know, if you're looking at a single study, well, how does that fit within the broader context of research that exists? You know, research should be for everyone. Um, making it more accessible would would help in that regard. But just want to pinpoint, I think that is a really critical one that I think can impact everyday people. Sorry, back to you. And anyone else who wants to weigh in on this? Um, I could weigh in just a little bit. And I am not an academic by any means, but I have worked with kids for a long time. And my, my wish in the way that, and my thought on trying to tackle this is that we have to get to the kids younger and younger. And... Um, and make it like a mindset that they have that's learned. Um, and not, not that it's utter and total skepticism of everything that they see, but just that they have the critical thinking skills. And mainly because they're on social media and they're online at such younger and younger ages. And so that is, that is one, we are not, we at MediaWise are not quite there yet, but it is one of our goals to try to come up with um, some curriculum type things for it elementary age kids because they're getting online when they're nine and 10 years old and younger even. So that's my thought. Do you, do you mind if I mention 
two initiatives just rele relevant to that in our broader team. One is called Start Schools Project in among our team, and that is a randomized controlled trial run by primary school kids, so kids around 10 and 11 years of age. And the second one is a, a, what's called the Kids Trial, which has been run by one of the PhD students on our team. Just to mention that you might like, like to look at that, Kathleen, and anyone I else. I will look at that, thank you. So can I close the loop on that one, Jen? You can, and I mean, you know, more great yeah. examples of, of what we're trying to do in this series, which is bridge, you know, those who are producing yeah. evidence, or the evidence producers, researchers, with those who are relaying it, the evidence intermediaries. I mean, that has to be a big part of the sort of solution here in conversation, because when we're looking for, you know, information around what's happening in the world today, we're gonna go to social media. We're gonna go to news media. So I think, you know, we're certainly realizing at the Global Evidence Commission, the degree to which we can, you know, help to democratize some of the research evidence that exists so that it can have use in those many channels and forms, the better. Um, Francois Pierre now has the gargantuan task of recapping some of what we're hearing in the chat. And then I'm gonna loop back around and start posing some of the questions that are hanging in the chat as well. And sorry, I also wanted to say, Hello, Richard Morley from the Cochrane Consumers Network. Thanks for being here, one of our partners on this series. So, Francois Pierre, over to you. Thanks, Chen. Thanks uh, to all the speakers. And I think there's uh, a lot of great discussion and a great a lot of great questions in the chat box. Some of them have passed along to Maureen and Jen, so they'll be asking those in a moment. But just to recap some of the key themes uh, from the discussion, uh, the, mo the probably the first and uh, most important themes that comes across during the discussion in the chat box is the issue of trust. How do we generate trust uh, between uh, the public and also you know, those who are the evidence intermediaries and potentially the evidence producers? So this is extremely uh, a hot topic right now in the discussion. Um, one provided example about the importance of fact checking and um, also said that this is a key aspect, but uh, raise question about uh, strategies to debunk uh, potential myths and stuff like that. Uh, because, you know, again, the issue of trust, uh, how do you trust those who are doing the debunking? Are they actually doing this based on facts and evidence? So who do you trust? Um, discussion also about the use of technology and artificial intelligence as well concerns that we can't leave that debate up to Silicon Valley alone. So we need to get involved in that discussion because we do see uh, uh, potential benefits of, of course, of artificial intelligence and using algorithm perhaps to filter uh, misinformation and disinformation, but also potential risk. Uh, so the potential individuals or groups trying to push uh, disinformation campaigns can certainly use uh, artificial intelligence in a negative way. So concerns about this issue. Uh, also a lot of uh, discussion around the quality of evidence and strength of evidence. So how is it, how do we talk about that uh, when we're trying to address misinformation and disinformation? Um, uh, from a personal experience, I know that evidence sometimes is uncertain, mixed. Uh, how do we deal with that in a world where uh, people often want to know whether, whether it's true or false. Uh, we want clear answers. So how do we handle the, this issue of the quality of evidence, the strength of evidence, uh, as was brought up in the discussion? Also, how do we protect people? There may be some more vulnerable groups, including teens and other groups. So how can we protect them? What can be put in place uh, to protect uh, them uh, online, especially um uh, from uh, misinformation and disinformation campaigns. And perhaps lastly, um, I think it's a global um, discussion and we see that misinformation and disinformation can spread at the global level very rapidly. And some people expressed interest, I guess, from perhaps uh, building up on local initi initiatives like MediaWise and others so that we can uh, perhaps adapt what is being done by some organization, adapt it to our cultural or linguistic um, uh, characteristics. So um, this is in a nutshell, some of the themes that came up in the chat box. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that, Francois-Pierre. 
So um, we're going to continue posing some of the questions that are in the chat, even those some of which have been um, addressed. And so, San, I want to come to you because you gave such nice wrap up points. Um, and one of the questions that came in was, you know, to what extent or what's the source of some of those suggestions? And I, I, I did hear you interweave that. I will say I feel like some of this work on the journalism side gets a bad rap for not being robust enough on the evidence side. But I mean, I think some of the examples you gave, there's nothing like them globally in the world. And, you know, to the point earlier about reaching people where they are, I mean, we need more research in this area than not. But could you just help us understand? So you've been in this world for quite some time. What are some of the sources uh, that that led to your kind of sharing of some of those ideas today? Right. Uh, and that's the big issue with a lot of the misinformation research that is that is focused on uh, in the U.S. and sort of developed industrial democracies, as in the U.K. or Germany, and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of the work, uh, so the path defining work, is based in the U.S. Um, and that comes from um, uh, scholars like Brendan Nyhan, Jason Reifler. Um, Brendan, Brendan is at the at Dartmouth, Jason Reifler, who's a professor at University of Exeter. Um, so, and, you know, the large group of co-authors you know, who have been doing this work uh, in the US uh, focused on misinformation and polarization. Uh, there have been little uh, sort of work that would, you know, test these theories in, a, in the global South. You know, and that's where a lot of the action is taking place in developing countries, in non-homogeneous and diverse societies. Um, so some of the work in, in South Asia is being done um, my, by my colleagues, such as um, Sumitra Badrinathan, uh, um, who's at American University in DC. Um, also uh, her co-author, um, well, I'm just bad with names these days. I'm just getting old. <laughs> <laughs> um, by Simon Chaucher, who's at, uh, who's in Madrid um, at the One March Institute. And they're working on this new project on digital literacy campaigns and testing the efficacy of digital literacy campaigns in India. Uh, so that work is, I know it's on the field right now. Uh, and also my work, which is a lot of it is in the field work phase. Um, and it's and about the supply and demand side, I would, I would encourage everyone to uh, go to the website of the Trust and News Project uh, at the Reuters Institute, and that was my my previous pit stop, uh, where they have a lot of data, a lot of information uh, on what news organizations can do and what are the challenges they face. Uh, especially in regards to trust and misinformation. And that's the work that I've been doing, they've been doing over the last three years. And I would highly recommend checking out the last report uh, that uh, we authored uh, from the Reuters Institute, and which focuses on the solutions that news organizations can use um, towards combating this trust gap between the audience and news outlets. Thanks so much, Sam. And I'll just say as a freelance reporter, you know, I look to that report too for ideas around news and trends. And, you know, er earlier you had made the point around a shift to solutions journalism. I mean, I think solutions journalism, especially in areas like the climate crisis, compel looking at best available evidence um, and can move us closer to stories that rather than, you know, create fear and paralysis can um, inspire hope and, and action. I'm just gonna ramp up the most recent um, question because it's getting a lot of uh, interest in the chat. And Paul, I'm gonna come to you for this. I'll just try to recap what David Goldman um, posed after this question came into the chat. So where does openly debating all sides of the issue fit into the debunking process? And, and David shares that he's a public health practitioner. He's observed uh, the public health experts during the pandemic. We knew we were gonna talk about COVID-19 at some point. And he felt that the biggest contributor to public distrust was that the knowledge about COVID developed in real time and in a very public way. Um, the public naturally wants info that's black and white and the evolution of the pandemic was anything but. But as scientists know that our knowledge of something novel develops by, um, it happens over time 
Uh, and, you know, so, he, so that's one of the things that he wonders about, you know, did this very public unopening of what do we know actually kind of spur some of the, the misinformation and conspiracy theories. But, you know, the real question I think we're trying to get at here is what role does openly debating all sides of the issue fit in this debunking process? We'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, I, I, I very firmly on the side of being open about uncertainty. Um, most, an, an awful lot of the questions just as a microcosm on eye health facts uh, end up with, we are not really sure as to, you know, how to answer that. But I do agree. I think we can't, I think it's really the nub of the issue. We can't talk about trust and restoring trust unless we're trustworthy. And I think we've seen public health experts come out time and time again during the pandemic and, and state something as black and white, which is not black and white. And then it transpires it wasn't black and white at all anyway. So it is the absolute nub of the matter. I don't understand the instinct to be black and white in situations where you're not sure. Now, I, you know, and, and public health experts might argue that you have to. Uh, I think uh, honesty is the key to trust and to um, countering uh, polarization. And I think Joanna, you have found that in your in your work. Um, yeah, I think for sure. Yeah. Can I add a little bit to that? Is it okay if I talk a little bit? Okay. So I um, completely agree with what Paula just said, and but I do kind of understand the instinct or the, the this pull on the part of professionals. And I've heard this from the professionals that I've spoken to, to try to provide certainty. They worry that if they can't provide a yes or no, a black and white answer to the questions that people are posing to them, that it will undermine their credibility um, and that people will go away feeling confused and less trusting. But what I've heard from members of the public is actually the opposite of that, that they they appreciate when nuance and ambiguity is introduced and when they're given the agency to sort of sit in that ambiguity even like even if they don't come away with a clear answer at the end just being given the room within the relationship with the evidence mediator to to sit in that ambiguity and then make an ambiguous decision based on limited evidence i think um it is really impactful for developing trust and something that a lot of the folks that I've spoken to have reported wanting more of from the people they talk to about health information. And I'll just say too, from, you know, from a journalism perspective, I, I, I think journalism is, um, as what we've been discussing today, these are disciplines in, in verification. Um, and as much as we'd like for things to land, you know, uh, very clearly, the reality is we have to be comfortable communicating um, uncertainty. And, you know, I think about the elements of journalism, which would have been a core text for, you know, people studying journalism. And the one that really has always struck with me is how do you make what's important, interesting and a pleasure for people to learn about? And that includes uncertainty. You know, at the end of the day, here's the information, but you're still going to have to make decisions about your own health, about your own life, about where you spend your money, volunteer your time, um, based on your own perspectives. Did anyone else want to get into that last question? I think we're going to be able to pose maybe two more otherwise. Um, and the one I'm going to, okay, I'm not saying hands up. So the one I'm going to put forward is, you know, what's the role of government? And in, so this came in through the chat. What's the role of government and informed policy experts play in tackling misinformation? Because uh, we can't leave the conversation in Silicon Valley alone, right? Otherwise, there's going to be answers to these questions coming at us at warp speed through social media. So what is the role um, of, of government and policymakers? Anyone want to weigh in on that? And I will, I will say we, had, we were hoping to have the OECD recently released its Mis and Disinformation Hub, resource hub. Um, they're having a webinar in a few weeks from now. And it, that resource is specifically targeting government. So we're going to be following that particular um, innovation uh, for this series in the future. But any comments on that? It's okay if we're uncertain. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm hugging here. So um, I would say that the same principles uh, that we've discussed with um, citizens in general apply to government and policymakers. So being well-informed and, and being able to think critically about 
uh, health claims and lobbyists and that kind of thing. Um, you know, I think that's that's hugely important. So it, I think government like and, and also ties in with, well, why would we trust them? <laughs> do you know? So so how much do they know? How much do they understand about critical thinking and uncertainty and risk and all of those kind of things? So it's I think it's the same principles um, uh, before they have a role, they have to <laughs> up their game, maybe. Well, and I think about the uh, sense about science in the UK, uh, I think many globally are learning from, um, and they just selected a Canadian for one of their major awards, just FYI, if you're on their socials. But, you know, they, I think they have a really a simple premise that's also evidence-based. They've, they've uh, evaluated this particular initiative, ask for evidence, you know, asking people, how do you know? Um, I remember one of the first, um, uh, courses in this in journalism was we sat down with a source just continuously asked them why when you ask why 30 times you get 30 different answers you know so I think we need to become comfortable asking people how do you know um, there was a really important question in there about a safety net and young people so I, I want to pose that question since information and communication technology is so central to their lives nowadays and I would say all of our lives but Certainly young people have had an initiation to social media that um, the rest of us hasn't, haven't. Um, so young people are particularly vulnerable to propaganda, misinformation, and fake news. I would, I would counter that to say, because they've grown up with it, I think they ask a lot more questions than we give them credit for. I think if they become a bit more acclimatized than those of us who got this social media onslaught later in our lives. But what are the safety nets that can be used to protect them. And Kathleen, I, I wanna come to you and I wanna open it up to others, but it just strikes me that what you've done at MediaWise is you've given them the tools to be able to ask those questions. How do you know, Kathleen? Uh, <clears throat> so that that is sort of the purpose of the um, of the videos is not just fact check, but to also teach them how we did the fact check. Um, but that's interesting that you asked that question because we have just started and we're in the very early stages of like the video series called how to internet and it is we're going to try to aim it at younger people um, our first one that we did and it's, I don't it's not even published yet but it's you know how to um, make an email account talking about making safe passwords talking about starting a social media account that is private not public and why is that important so so these are kind of some of the things that we're going to address a lot of them are safety issues um, um, and, I, and I think, again, it has to just go to these younger kids. It has to be aimed at fourth, fifth graders. Um, and that's what, that's what this will hopefully try to do. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it mm -hmm. does. Anyone else want to weigh in there? Yeah, just add to that uh, is from personal experience and just doing field work in India. And also the data is already out there. Uh, on the penultimate report from the Reuters Institute, is what we found is people do correct themselves in offline settings. You know, they get together and they talk about contentious issues where the people might have seen instances of misinformation or disinformation, and they correct themselves. So there's this offline correction that's happening that sometimes we are not uh, taking into account. And that's where the fact-checking and this digital and this technological affordances come in because if you have one person who has been exposed to uh, this fact checking and these corrections online, then they can inform others in a group in an offline setting, and that is uh, tremendously helpful. Now we don't have experimental evidence yet, uh, but that's something that would come from the academic side in the company. We, and, and I so want to make um, just one other yep. point is that we have done a couple of, um, from what you're saying, saying, is a couple of videos on how to talk to your relatives who are um, maybe a part of the uh, misinformation um, world. Like, how do you approach them? How to do it in a way that there'll be a good back and forth that's civil. So that's another one of the things we're trying to address. Brilliant, thanks so much. Maureen, I'm gonna to come to you for a final comment just before we close. 
Yeah, that's a wrap. We're right on time. Uh, incredible discussion. Um, just so much hope for the future. One of the things that I couldn't unhear from those two half day sessions that I heard was, um, well, they have uh, the people who are peddling the misinformation have experts too. So I think that we've addressed we've addressed that question about how to how to do that, and it's a work in progress. I'm sure um, Mike Wilson is doing a, a evident, living evidence synthesis of the strategies for that. So stay tuned for that, and especially join us in 2024 for our fourth webinar in the series about co-designing structures and processes to support citizens and designing, executing, and holding leaders accountable for achieving changes on the ground that are felt by everyday citizens. I'm sure it's going to be a great session. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. You're inspiring. Your work is um, just inspiring. There's no other way to say it and keep up the good work. And uh, we hope that this was a really valuable session for everyone. And thank you so much for everyone who took time from their busy day to attend. And may the rest of your day, whatever time it is there for you, be, be enjoyable. Thank you so much. Thank you. That adjourns today's webinar. Have a good day, evening, everyone. And we hope to catch you on the flip side.